It's been almost two years since the release of The Witcher 3, and nearly a year since we received the final piece of Geralt's storyline, but we still can't get enough of this game. With a sprawling narrative across dozens of hours of gameplay, pieces of story tucked behind stones, toppled by trolls, and secrets hidden across the Northern Realms, Time with The Witcher is beloved by gamers around the world. Hi, I'm Brendan with The Leaderboard, and we're diving into the final chapter of a world full of high fantasy, political intrigue, and monster hunts. So sharpen your silver sword, grab your medallion, and ready your deck because here's 107 facts about The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Let's get started. The aptly named Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt is the third installment of The Witcher series, developed by CD Projekt Red. It was released worldwide on May 19th, 2015. The Witcher 3 concludes the story of Geralt of Rivia. As of right now, the only Witcher-based game that CD Projekt Red has planned is Gwent, the Witcher card game for PS4. Gwent is a card game played in Witcher 3 and is set to be a game that can be played with others online. The game is currently in beta that anybody can sign up for. The overarching story of The Witcher 3 is to find Ciri, a young woman with incredible magic powers and keep her safe from the people involved in the Wild Hunt. She was mentioned in the original Witcher game and was in the original source books, but hadn't made an appearance until now. Unlike the last two Witcher games where you can only play as Geralt, at some point the Wild Hunt allows the gamer to play as a second person. Yep, that's right, it's Siri. The Witcher 3 has many nods and callbacks to the first and second games, and luckily players have the option of transferring data from their save file in The Witcher 2. Fear not, if you haven't played The Witcher 2, the game gives you the choice of making up the story on the fly, much like in Mass Effect 2 and 3. The Wild Hunt comes with two expansions that have extra gameplay and quests. The first to be released was Hearts of Stone, and the second was Blood and Wine. Hearts of Stone introduces a new antagonist, Olgierd von Everick, as well as new creatures to fight in combat, while reintroducing some old friends like Shani, who also happens to be a romance option, and bringing them back into Geralt's storyline. While Blood and Wine deals with vampires in the end, the expansion is much more lighthearted than the rest of The Witcher 3. The setting is much brighter, and the characters in the background seem much less oppressed than that of the rest of the series. Blood and Wine also introduces the vineyard that Geralt receives at the beginning of the expansion. Here the player can customize Geralt's home, lab, to work on an experiment with mutagens, and Roach's stable to give him more health and stamina. The Witcher games are based off a series of Polish fantasy books written in 1986 by Andrzej Sapkowski, who's been described as the Polish J.R.R. Tolkien, by fans and critics alike. Ironically enough, before he even thought of writing The Witcher stories, he was a traveling fur salesman who graduated with a degree in economics. Sapkowski came up with the Witcher character after trying to reinvent an old Polish fairy tale about a poor cobbler who wanted to achieve the impossible, killing a dragon. He claimed that no one would ever conceive of calling upon a cobbler for help, and he considered knights and warriors to be too, well, stupid most of the time in his mind. In his mind, a Witcher was a professional monster hunter and a much more qualified man or woman for the job. Interestingly enough, Sapkowski never had any real interest in video games, and he was not convinced that The Witcher would succeed as a game series. When CD Projekt Red came to him with the idea, he took all the money up front instead of collecting as the games continued to come out. He definitely thinks that was short-minded of himself now, seeing as how the series has sold over 25 million copies. Some fans of the Witcher book series were a little concerned with the differences between the books and the games, but CDPR has mentioned long ago that the games would not be a direct adaptation of the novels. This would be especially difficult to keep track of since The Witcher 3 is such an expansive world map with many different options for dialogue. But if you enjoyed the books, there's a Witcher graphic novel heavily influenced by the games. The Witcher 3 game was originally sold with a graphic novel titled The Witcher Killing Monsters. The art was done by Max Bertolini and it was written by Paul Tobin. Before The Witcher 3's release, Paul Tobin worked on a Witcher miniseries called House of Glass. It was well received among fans of The Witcher, but it was difficult for a newbie to get into because it did not provide any background info on The Witcher world or Geralt. The House of Glass segment is a Witcher-themed standalone, as it features a broad cast of characters that did not appear in the game and is five issues long. Two people closely attached to the Witcher series have never played any of the titles. The first is Sapkowski, who has never played any of the Witcher games, but has seen all of the game's artwork and commented that those pieces alone were, quote, a sight to behold. The second is CD Projekt Red's co-founder, Michael Kaczynski, who hasn't played Witcher 3. What are they waiting for? CD Projekt Red was not the first studio to delve into the idea of making a Witcher game. The first studio to give it a shot was Studio Metropolis, but it never ended up gaining any traction like the current games did. 
The budget for The Witcher 3 is estimated at 306 million zloty, that's 81 million US dollars, and while 81 million dollars sounds like a lot, compared to other games of similar scope, it's actually more like a budget price. For example, GTA 5 was estimated to cost around 265 million dollars, and Star Wars The Old Republic cost around 200 million. The Witcher 3 took three and a half years to develop, which is about the same time it took to develop the previous title in the Witcher series, Assassins of Kings. The original game, however, took five years to complete. So with three and a half years under development, you would think that it would hit the shelves on time, right? Well, the game had to be pushed back in its original release date not once, but twice. Of course, pushing back a game's release is pretty common. CD Projekt Red also had good reasons, as they wanted to ship a game that was a very smooth and polished experience. One of the game's biggest promises that The Witcher 3 made in development was to give quests that felt like they were integral to the world. Gone would be the days of grinding for experience by killing boars in the woods by hand, and collecting rat tails for the local nut job offering a copper or two. What's he gonna do with them? Even with all the success and good press that The Witcher 3 had received before its initial release, some fans were upset with the difference in graphics that had been previewed in 2013. What had been shown early on versus what had been given in the final product was an obvious downgrade, but after playing the game, most fans noticed that the downgrade did not inhibit the gameplay or storytelling whatsoever. You know the old joke, how many people does it take to develop a video game? Wait. That's not a joke. Anyway, in this case, the studio had about 250 employees in-house working on the game, and that's not including the hundreds, if not thousands, who worked around the world on elements such as localization. To ensure authenticity, CD Projekt Red brought microphones to actual battle reenactments so they could bring each battle scene to life. And for the massive amount of dialogue that's available for players to experiment with in The Witcher 3, there were only 14 people on the game to create the cinematic dialogue system to bring the game together. This team included animators and programmers. All of the dialogue options were put together using an algorithm to make it easier to create and make it more authentic for players to become immersed into. Lip syncing's a big deal, guys. But it looks like all that hard work paid off. The Witcher 3 has received more Game of the Year awards than any other game in the world. With a total of 251 awards, it beat the previous year's score of 249 awards, which was held by The Last of Us. Sorry, Ellie and Joel. And that award is well-deserved. Players have logged over 100 hours of gameplay in The Witcher 3. While the first two games were also open world, this last installment is so much larger, not to mention the extra 50 hours worth of DLC and side quests. For the overachieving players out there, The Witcher 3 also has 60 plus trophies and achievements that you can unlock, some of which include Assassins of Kings, in which you have to assist the King of Radovid, Fast and Furious, in which you have to win a horse race, and The Limits of the Possible, in which you have to collect all of the trophies in the game. They really weren't joking when they said this game was almost limitless. Along with all these new quests, players can collect six new Witcher gear sets that consist of <gasps> Starter Gear, Serpentine, Griffin, Feline, Ursine, Wolven, Viper, and Manticore gear. Who doesn't like to dress up their tortured adventurous monster hunter every once in a while? It's my personal hobby. Every side quest the player takes part in adds depth and character building to the story of The Witcher 3, but at the same time, it isn't keeping anything from the main plot of the game. The creators wanted to make sure that none of the extra pieces in the game felt like they needed to be completed, but they also didn't want the player to complete something with nothing gained. Take notes, Mass Effect Andromeda. If you're tired of side missions, fist fights, main storylines, monster hunts, and more, there's always the most popular pastime in Temeria and beyond, Gwent. This army building card game replaces the dice games from the previous two titles. In games of Gwent, there are different decks that represent types of factions. What's interesting is that these decks and their respective cards are modeled after the political factions and leaders in the game's world. It would be like playing a card game where you had President Trump pitted against Prime Minister Trudeau. Kim Jong-un's card is useless and he does nothing. In the base game, there there's a quest given called Collect Them All, where you are tasked to collect every single Gwent card in the game. This is no small feat, as there are 183 cards in the game alone, and that is not including the leader cards. The factions that can be found in Gwent include the Northern Realms, Nilfgaard, Soyatael, and Monsters. Later expansions include Skellig as a new faction in the game. So which faction are you? Let us know in the comments below. Did I pronounce them wrong? Tell me too. I don't know how to pronounce Soyat... Skoy... Sk it's been a while since I played this game, guys. One of the cards in the Nilfgaard deck is the Black Infantry Archer. On the card's descriptive text, you can find the line, I aim for the knee, always. So maybe this guy knows a guy in Whiterun. Like archers, they like, they chill, right? They go to like archer conventions. Yo, what's going on? I'm an archer. You shoot arrows too? 
cool! Later, when the Hearts of Stone expansion was released, a new Gwent card was added known as the Cow. When the Cow was removed from the playing field, a Chort would appear in its place. This is in reference to the bovine defense system easter egg that was released in a patch. Game director Conrad Tomaszkowicz is a big fan of Dark Souls and Demon Souls. He stated that he loved how players themselves became stronger as they learned to feel the fight, and implemented this element into the combat gameplay of Witcher 3. In fact, players and game reviewers alike have both mentioned that Geralt's sword fighting and combat skills have been very smooth and easy to adapt to, as well as being beautiful to look at. This is because CD Projekt Red brought in master swordsman Maciek Kwiatkowski from a group called Stunt Forces to specifically motion capture the movement for Geralt. Motion capture was used for most of the cutscenes in the game, which made the character's movement seem very realistic. The motion capture technology used was newer for CD Projekt Red, but it's similar to the motion capture used in film and animation. How does one go about making an expansive open world RPG with multiple storylines and intricate interweaving quests? Well, it helps to have your own in-house game engine. Witcher 3 was created using Red Engine 3. It was so reliable that CDPR is using it again for their upcoming Cyberpunk 2077. According to both Miles Tost, one of The Witcher 3's level designers, and Jonas Matson, the senior environment artist, several video games helped inspire level design, such as The Legend of Zelda series and Red Dead Redemption. But as the game is an extremely expansive open world set in a fantasy setting, many people can't help but compare it to, you know, Skyrim. However, The Witcher 3's map is 20% bigger than that of Skyrim and has more than a million lines of code in it. The game also boasts a very long list of enemies that you can come across in the open world of The Witcher. Throughout the Wild Hunt, Hearts of Stone, and Blood and Wine, there are a total of 83 casual enemies and bosses combined. CDPR dug deep into Northern Europe mythology to bring traditional monsters to life in The Witcher 3. They wanted to make the cast of creatures more interesting than just throwing in the common vampire or zombie. A few of the more notable monsters from the game include Leshen, Botchling, and the Wild Hunt themselves. Leshen, originally known as Leshi or Leshi in Slavic folklore, are closely related to the Wendigo forest spirit of the Algonquin people. They're found in thick, dense forests, and their powers control the environment around them. Not much has changed from the myth to the game other than the slightly more disturbing appearance. While CDPR didn't want to put in a stereotypical zombie in the Witcher universe, they did give us botchlings. These creatures are what's left of an unborn child with no name and no grave. They seek out expecting mothers and assault them, unless Geralt has something to say about it. In Northern European mythos, these creatures aren't depicted in such a dark light, though they are still just as tragic. They're the spirits of children who haven't been baptized, and were abandoned by parents who could not afford to care for them. The Wild Hunt didn't differ much from mythos to game, apart from the fact that they were tailored to be a great adversary for Geralt and his company. In the legends, they are a horde of spectral elves who travel between dimensions and bring war wherever they go. They were also known to capture anybody who dared to stand against them much like in the game. Off the coast and into the archipelagos of the Northern Realms is Skellige. This is home to many clans who have often been described as pirates and pillagers off the shores of the continent. The people you find here are reminiscent of a combination of Nordic and Celtic cultures. Skellige is derived from the Gaelic word Skellig, which roughly translates to rocks and cliff. Considering the landscape of the surrounding region, it's a rock-solid reason for the name. Hey, like rocks. I'll see myself out. Depending on which decisions you make in certain quests, Velen, Novigrad, and Skellige could turn out to be very different from another player's world in which they play. Geralt has interactions with many people during his journey as a Witcher, and now in The Witcher 3, there are up to nine possible romance options, including major love interests Triss Marigold and the sorceress Yennefer. Geralt can also visit a brothel, but we're not so sure that counts as like a full-on romance between the characters on screen. I mean, you do you, G. You do you. The only two romance options that you can end Geralt's story with are Yennefer and Triss. He's had complicated relationships with both of these women, going all the way back to the original Witcher game. Doug Cockle said that one of the weirdest experiences voicing Geralt in The Witcher 3 was doing the sex scenes. He stated that when you're doing it in the booth, there's a different kind of awkwardness, because it isn't like masturbation. You're being caught masturbating. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you don't have to answer that, guys. We're really cool about that. You got lots to talk about in the comments below. So while Geralt might be the Witcher, he isn't the only Witcher. Witchers are those who have undergone extensive of training to become monster slayers for hire. They're often frowned upon in society until they're needed most by those in danger. 
In order to become a witcher, one must undergo the trial of the grasses. This was an incredibly deadly concoction of herbs that only three in 10 were said to survive. If you did survive, you would come out with enhanced strength, reflexes, and senses. Heck, you even got some really cool viper eyes to boot. Love me them viper eyes. Look at those viper eyes. Do they see in the dark? I don't know. Do they get the ladies? Ask the nine romance options. There are different trains of thought amongst witchers that divide them into several schools. Some of these schools include cat, wolf, bear, and two that were introduced in the second and third game, Viper and Manticore. While we only ever meet witchers who are human in-game, it is possible that there was, once upon a time, non-human witchers. This is indicated by in-game text found in a laboratory, and is noted that those of the cat school primarily were of elven descent. What are the essential tools of the witcher trade? A steel sword for slaying people, a silver sword for killing critters, and a special medallion that aids them in tracking down their foes. Another aspect of being a witcher that is featured in the games is the ability to make potions and concoctions. These potions will grant a witcher enhanced abilities or increased healing. But be careful if you're part of the normal public. A sip of this stuff is deadly and can easily kill you. The Witchers can also enhance their abilities by using the mutagens they find after killing monsters. In game, you unlock mutagen slots to be able to increase your abilities, with bonuses being awarded if you match the color of the mutagen with an ability of the same color. While Geralt had many abilities that were aided by mutagens in The Witcher 1 and 2, he now has a more extensive catalog of maneuvers for the third installment. These abilities include his Witcher Sense, which helps him locate hidden items. Items, fighting on horseback and while underwater, and using a crossbow. Many of Geralt's new mutations become available in Blood and Wine, and much like Geralt would have to do in real life, the player must study the mutations to be able to unlock the talent tree for their character. There are 12 mutations made available to players in total, and they can come in the form of combat, signs, or alchemy. Geralt's horse is named Roach. As a trusty companion, you can even mount trophies onto his saddle, because severed hag's heads are all the fashion in Temeria. If Roach is Geralt's trusty steed and favored mode of transportation, then what's his least favorite? Portals. Enough said. Maybe he should stop hanging around certain sorceresses. And don't go to Aperture Science, dude. You will not have a fun time. On April Fool's Day in 2016, CDPR thought it would be funny to tell the world that Roach had been bugged. <laughs> on purpose. To tell the world that Roach had been bugged on purpose, being that her original motion capture animations were quote, too good, and they needed to remind players they were simply playing a game. Roach's glitch was so infamous that the folks over at CDPR even made her her own card in Gwent that references when she would appear in random places after being called by Geralt. Many games like Witcher 3 aren't immune to glitches when they're first released. Another major one that occurred occasionally made Geralt invincible. Not only was he blessed with invincibility, but he could also attack with infinite damage per second and have infinite sign intensity. Some players may have thought that this was the way to go, so there would be no stress playing through the wild hunt. However, some recommended doing the exact opposite of this, and playing The Witcher 3 at the highest difficulty setting to add to the story. Not only can you create an ultimate version of Geralt, but you can also make sure he has infinite money. This glitch takes place in the White Orchard and allows the player to get thousands of crowns in a very short amount of time. So apparently CD Projekt Red really likes to point out when players have utilized exploits to make money. If you used the glitch exploit to make money, you may have been visited by the tax man. If you admitted guilt on all charges, you'd be charged a thousand crowns. There was originally a glitch in Blood and Wine where a noblewoman wearing a red dress would follow Geralt wherever he went throughout the city. A patch was released to fix this problem, but fans thought it was rather hilarious and cataloged it all over the internet. This noblewoman would even go as far as to clap her hands and cheer for Geralt. The idea of Geralt having some strange woman stalk him is certainly pretty funny considering his line of work. Of course, The Witcher 3 also has its fair share of Easter eggs. For example, in a secondary quest in Skellige called Tower Out of Nowhere, you're sent by a mage to remove the, quote, Defensive Regulatory Magicor, DRM for short, by using a spell found in Gottfried's Omni Opening Grimmery. If CD Projekt Red did not make that stance on DRM clear before, it sure as ever is, thanks to this easter egg. In Novigrad, there's an elf who runs a blacksmith shop by the name of Hattori. Finish his quest and he'll reward you with an extremely fine sword. This is a reference to the blacksmith who crafts Uma Thurman's sword in the movie Kill Bill, Hattori Hanzo. The Witcher 3 also gives a subtle nod to Game of Thrones, another fantasy giant. In a pirate-controlled castle in Skellige, you will be able to spot the corpse of a dwarf who bears a striking resemblance to a certain Tyrion Lannister. During the Fist of Fury side quests, you'll be able to face a couple of opponents that may sound a bit familiar. 
earlier. Durden the Tailor is the final opponent in Novigrad, and is an obvious reference to Tyler Durden in Fight Club. And another opponent is named Georgius George, a name to Gorgeous George, the boxer from the movie Snatch. The guards in Skellige will occasionally be overheard yelling, This is Skellige! Just like Leonidas would for his homeland of Sparta in the movie 300. Of course, along with its many other references, there are a plethora of Monty Python nods and Easter eggs scattered among the northern realms. You might hear thieves shout, Your mother was a hamster and your father smelled of elderberries! Or you might even come across a cave with a pile of corpses and a single snow hair. Beware the rabbit of Cabernog! Not even Geralt is safe from the most infamous of movie tropes, the Wilhelm scream. If you fall off a particularly large height, you will occasionally be treated to the sound that just won't die. One easter egg that is only achievable if you've played the previous title is the mission hungover in Assassins of Kings that leaves Geralt with a tattoo on his neck. If he doesn't have it removed and the save is imported into the Wild Hunt, Geralt will still have the body ink in the game. An easter egg that appears in Blood and Wine is in Toussaint, when Geralt is in a duel against a very tall tall man who goes by the name of Grigory Gorgon. He seems to have a striking similarity to Sir Gregor Clagan, the mountain from Game of Thrones. One of the older memes of the internet, Leroy Jenkins snuck his way into the Blood and Wine expansion. In the land of Tucson, the notice for a vigil for Sir Leroy, a man who died in a one-armed raid against monsters, is posted. There's a graveyard near the middle of the map with some interesting names on the tombstones. Some of these names include Jean-Luc Picard, someone who apparently traveled from Thetis, the continent of Dragon Age, and a hand full of the development staff of CDPR. Praise the sun! Even Dark Souls gets a shout out in the form of a sword stuck in a bonfire. It can be found in a cave after defeating the Cloud Giant boss. Geralt can also ignite the fire using his Igni Sun. The sword can be pulled from the fire and is called Gishaft. Another Game of Thrones reference has been popped into the land of Tuisson. You may come across a young girl running past Geralt shouting, My brother gave me a sword! I named it Needle! Hey Arya, what's going on? Our personal favorite easter egg though? As you wander around the countryside, you might come across a bear. You may even be inclined to kill this bear. What you may notice at first though is that this bear wears a red shirt and collects honey. It's none other than Winnie the Pooh, just as A.A. A. Milne intended. Do the weather vanes in the cities look familiar to you? That might be because CD Projekt Red inserted their logo at the Red Cardinal as a replacement for your typical rooster weather vane. In 2016, CDPR mentioned in a Polish Witcher 3 panel that not all of the easter eggs within Blood and Wine have been found by players. One of these secrets is a quest that leaves the player with no reward. Geralt retrieves a lost engagement ring only to watch the woman missing it dance away in an odd manner. We're getting the feeling that the game programmers were starting to get loopy after coding all of these different side quests for so long. The second secret that CDPR mentioned is a man that has a unique leopard. The leopard supposed a reference to Mike Tyson and the tigers he used to keep his pets. Only this time the man who keeps the giant cat is qualified to take care of it. If you're wondering why Gaunter Odim looks familiar, it's because, well, he is. Without giving too much away, his facial model is hidden throughout the expansion in several spots, foreshadowing the possibility of who he really might be. Did you spot him? Another new mechanic introduced in Hearts of Stone was the ability to apply runes to your weapons. This was done through an off-eary rune rite, and would allow you to enhance your abilities to new heights such as a deadly spinning attack. A little less useful but still hilarious rune was the dumplings rune word. Yes, it did cause all food consumed to regenerate 100% more vitality, but it also made the food taste like dumplings. If you could get a rune for pizza, I feel like I'd be set. If you wanted realistic hair, you've got it. Facial hair, that is. Geralt's beard grows in real time, so get ready to fork over some crowns if you want to stay freshly shaved. Geralt was almost an ice skater. Originally, towards the end of the game, players would be able to battle as Geralt while on skates, but CDPR decided that introducing a new mechanic mechanic this far in would be just too wonky. In The Witcher 3, choices matter, and you might not realize some of these choices until much later in the game. Overall, The Wild Hunt has a total of 36 different endings. There are three main story endings that you can get in The Witcher 3, and the way to get each of them depends on how Geralt makes choices during battle preparations, blood on the battlefield, and final preparations. As far as character endings, Geralt has three possible endings as far as who he ends up with and where he ends up. Other characters who have multiple endings consist of Emperor Emphir Kar Emrys, the Baron of Velen, and whoever may become the leader of the Skellige Islands. Before the third installment in the series, The Witcher games had only sold about 10 million units collectively. After the release of The Witcher 3, the franchise has now sold over 25 million units. Overall, The Witcher 3 has received nearly universal praise, receiving a 92 aggregate score on Metacritic. 
CDPR is currently working on Cyberpunk 2077, their next project after The Witcher, and they aim to make it an even bigger and broader world than that of Geralt's. Jose Tejeria, visual effects artist for CDPR, stated that The Witcher 3 helped teaching the team what they'll need to know to be able to bring Cyberpunk 2077 to life. While The Witcher 3 is the end of Geralt's storyline, CD Projekt Red isn't ruling out the possibility of a sequel in the future, just not in the near future. Could this mean a new Witcher is in our midst? Or maybe will we get the chance to explore the world through one of Geralt's companions? Many fans have wished one of the ways to be able to enjoy the vast world of The Witcher 3 was in first person. Normally players watch Geralt walk and run throughout the game, but some modders have started experimenting with the first person on the PC. Think you have what it takes to be a Witcher? Well, you can put yourself to the test and apply to Witcher School in Poland, which is really just an adult LARP inspired by the series. You get to live in a castle and transform into the heroes of the book and the games. Once again, I'm Brendan, and thanks for watching 107 Facts About The Witcher 3. Did we miss any Easter eggs? Comment below and let us know, and don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. And if you like getting more from your games, make sure to subscribe to the leaderboard, where we help you game smarter.